Hello friends, today I want to dive into a very hot topic which everybody I am sure has difficulties. It is about trying to identify the stroke syndromes easily and quickly. You can definitely identify the stroke location and responsible arteries by remembering three simple figures. First I will describe box and circle figure and after that I will show you the girl figure. You can also give uh, different uh, imaginary names uh, to those figures uh, through comments. Okay, uh, let's dive into this. Stroke is a critical situation so we must ask question ourselves every time that is it brainstem involved or not because it is the most important part of the brain, right? So how do we even know that we are dealing with the brainstem stroke in first place? It is the presence of cross findings where deficits in the face are on the opposite side as deficits in the body. This pattern of cross findings that should immediately make you think brainstem shock. Once you have a sense that lesion is in the brainstem, your thinking then starts to find out where exactly stroke is. Basically, there are three main questions uh, blossoming in your brain. First, what part of the brainstem? Is it lesion in the midbrain, the pons or the medulla? Second, is it located medially or laterally in this region? And the third, is the lesion on the right or left side. Please look at this image. You can easily remember most of the structures that distinguish the location of stroke. You can also tell which artery is affected. And by that you are able to answer all the of the three questions I have just described. To answer the first question, we will need to use what we know about cranial nerves in each region. Recall the rule of force, which uh, states that uh, the first four cranial nerves exit from the brain and midbrain, with third nerve specifically exiting from the midbrain, while the middle four exit from the pons and the last four exit from the medulla. This nerve serves as a helpful clues to tell you what part of the brainstem has been affected on a craniocaudal axis of the brainstem. For example, if someone presents with an oculomotor nerve palsy, the lesion is likely to be at the level of the midbrain. In contrast, someone presenting with facial nerve palsy is likely to have lesion at the level of the pons, while a patient presenting with uh, hypoglossal nerve palsy is more likely to have a stroke in the medulla. To answer the second question whether the lesion is more medial or more lateral, by remembering the location of the main pathways in the brainstem. There are four main medial structures to think of and thankfully uh, they all begin with the letter M. The motor pathway means corticospinal tract, the medial lamiscus carrying fine touch, vibration and proprioception, uh, the medial longitudinal fasciculus that controls movements of the eyes, the motor component of some cranial nerves like three fourth uh, and six nerves that controlling eye movements and hypoglossal nerve that controlling the tongue movements. In contrast, there are four main structures that are found to the side, means literally, that each begin with the letters S. So the spinocerebellar pathway, spinothalamic tract carrying crude touch, temperature and pain, the sympathetic pathway traveling to the face, and sensory nuclei senses a face via the trigeminal nerve. Finally, to answer the third question, which side the lesion is on? In general, you can expect that deficits in the face will be ipsilateral to the side of the lesion while deficits in the body will be contralateral to the side of the lesion. This is because the cranial nerve supplies uh, ipsilaterally and sensory motor pathways like Corticospinal tract and medial lamniscus exit from the brainstem supplies contralateral body through spinal cord.
you must remember that uh, medial lemniscus is formed by the crossings of the internal arcuate fibers the internal arcuate fibers are composed of axons of the nucleus gracilis and nucleus cuneatus please remember that the axons of the nucleus gracilis and the nucleus cuneatus in the medial lemniscus have cell bodies that lie contrarily to the uh, medial lemniscus basically uh, corticospinal tract and fibers from medial lemniscus decussate at the level of caudal medulla you can see that in these images and uh, with these basics reviewed uh, we are now equipped to localize lesions in the brainstem so let's walk through a few scenarios together starting with the medulla at the bottom and working our way up as its name uh, suggests medial medullary syndrome involves lesion in the medial medulla if you look at this image you can see that uh, arrow there are three main structures in the middle medulla 12th 13th and 14th number i have just assigned the number 13 to corticospinal tract and number 14 to medial lemniscus for easy memorization so this syndrome manifests uh, through contralateral hemiparesis and hemisensory loss of the body except the face along with ipsilateral tongue weakness because of involvement of the 12th cranial nerve let's see how we could have predicted the location of the this, the, this lesion based on the clinical findings first uh, we know we are in the brainstem because of the presence of cross findings with contralateral hemiparesis presence in the body but not the face next we can figure out uh, the level of lesion by determining what cranial nerves are involved given in image that the 12th cranial nerve so we can feel confident saying that this lesion is localized to the medulla the tongue weakness will be ipsilateral since uh, you lick your wounds last question is whether the lesion is medial or lateral please consider that image you can see that all the medial structures are involved so by that we can confidently says that the lesion is at the medial medulla by comparing box image with uh, circle of phyllis uh, anterior spinal artery or vertebral artery is involved in this case i have already described uh, specific arteries in this box image because on test questions you may sometimes get asked not only to identify where the stroke is but also what artery is likely involved in contrast to medial medullary syndrome lateral medullary syndrome involves 9 10 and 11th cranial nerves that leads to difficulties with both speaking and swelling so basically uh, there is dysphagia hoarseness and intractable hiccups and uh, if you remember those uh, side structures that starts with s uh, are also involved in this case such as spinothalamic tract from contralateral body spinal trigeminal nucleus which carry sensation from the ipsilateral face sympathetic fibers uh, that ascends literally are responsible for horner syndrome problems with balance including ataxia vertigo and nystagmus should be there because of the involvement of the spinocerebellar tract Apart from that, uh, lateral medullary syndrome is associated with a stroke in the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, which I included in box image on the left side. If you visualize this box in your brain, uh, you can definitely answer most of the questions about brainstem strokes. You can also remember pica by some keywords. Uh, a stroke in the pica leads to problems with chewing. So you can remember this by thinking of the Pokemon Pikachu. This uh, should help you associate a uh, stroke in the pica with some of its most specific findings, which is in this case uh, involved difficulty with chewing and speaking. 
Moving on from the medulla to the pons, uh, lateral pontine syndrome is in many ways quite similar to lateral medullary syndrome, which we, we just talked about. Because the medial uh, lateral axis of the lesion is the same, so many of the same findings including loss of pain and temperature sensation contralaterally in the extremities and ipsilaterally in the face. Ipsilateral Horner syndrome and ipsilateral ataxia will still be present. Instead, only the level of the lesion has changed, meaning that different cranial nerves are going to be involved with cranial nerves 5 through 8, uh, cranial nerves 5 through, through 8 now being at play. With the 7th cranial nerve, affected uh, facial sensation and loss of taste from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue can appear. In addition, involvement of the 8th nerve can result in partial or complete deafness. Later pontine syndrome is associated with the stroke in the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. Uh, you can visualize from this box image. We can think uh, of the ICA as causing problems in the uh, facial sensation. In medial pontine syndrome, so medial pontine syndrome can also lead to facial asymmetry and horizontal gaze palsy because motor component of cranial nerves 5 through 8 involves facial muscles and extraocular eye movement. Just recall uh, those M letters. However, uh, there is also another medial structure that we need to account for in this uh, case, uh, the pons that was wasn't in the medulla, the medial longitudinal fasciculus. Now, this means that uh, medial pontine syndrome can produce internuclear ophthalmoplasia. Medial pontine syndrome is associated with occlusion of branches of, of the basilar artery. So you can remember that by comparing box and circle of Phyllis. Uh, let's talk about midbrain strokes. Midbrain strokes will al also produce cross findings. However, because only two cranial nerves exit from the midbrain, the oculomotor and trochlear nerve, the cross findings will tend to be more subtle involving only eye movements rather than a more dramatic presentation like facial asymmetry. Ever the rule uh, of cross finding uh, uh, still exists. It uh, just involves less nerves than before. So your primary clue to a midbrain stroke will be an oculomotor nerve palsy that manifests in ptosis, midriasis, and down and out position of the pupil. In addition to some form of motor findings, uh, depending on the uh, exit areas involved. Uh, the motor findings can present in a variety of uh, different ways. The condition most uh, classically associated with the medial midbrain stroke uh, is called as Weber syndrome. Weber syndrome involves the combination of ipsilateral oculomotor nerve palsy and contralateral hemiplegia. The last stroke we will talk about is a stroke in the basilar artery itself. As seen in these images, the basilar artery runs along the side of the pons and sends off branches to the midbrain. Because uh, it supplies all three parts of the brainstem, a stroke in the basilar artery, a stroke in the uh, basilar artery can have more severe and wide spectrum of signs and symptoms. Possible manifestation of uh, basilar artery stroke is known as locked in syndrome it is a very tragic condition in which someone is completely paralyzed due to damage of a corticospinal tract as well as most of the cranial nerves however because uh, reticular activating uh, system remains intact the person is usually completely aware of their situation involvement of corticospinal and corticobulbar tracts leads to quadriplasia and loss of voluntary facial, mouth, and tongue movements, respectively. Involvement of ocular cranial nerve nuclei and pyramidal pontine reticular formation leads to loss of horizontal but uh, not vertical eye movements.
Finally, we can summarize brainstem strokes from this table. You can do this just uh, uh, by reading uh, that uh, by yourself as I have already described that. So I don't want to read this table to waste your time. So sorry for that. From here, we will next turn our attention to cortical strokes. This is going to be the easiest part of learning about stroke areas. So let's go ahead. Okay, we will be going to learn stroke localization with specific mnemonics. Uh, because specific arteries supply specific parts of the brain, the signs and symptoms of stroke are largely dependent upon which vascular territories have been damaged. This is the basis of stroke localization. Uh, by that you can figure out where the stroke is likely occurred So let's see uh, first cortical strokes We will uh, we have learned that a uh, circle of willis which is composed of three pairs of arteries that supply this uh, cerebral cortex anterior middle and posterior cerebral arteries Because the cortex is responsible for high level functions uh, strokes in these arteries will produce uh, what are known as cortical signs such as neglect, aphasia and visual field loss. When you see cortical signs such as these, you should be thinking of stroke in the cerebral cortex. Moreover, certain parts of the body have more likely to be impaired according to which arteries are affected. Okay, let's talk about strokes in specific arteries starting with the anterior cerebral artery. In general, uh, strokes in the early parts of the anterior cerebral arteries don't cause much damage as there is abundant uh, collateral circulation through the various communicating arteries. However, occlusions uh, further down can lead to both paralysis and sensory loss in the contralateral lower limbs as well as urinary incontinence. Due to damage of the frontal lobe, difficulties in executive functioning can also occur. And in some cases, primitive reflexes like the Babinski sign, which is normally only found in babies till one year, can re-emerge. While in case of stroke in the middle cerebral artery, can result in both paralysis and sensory loss in contralateral upper limbs. Wernicke's areas are also supplied by MCA. So, if dominant hemisphere, which is usually the left, is involved, uh, there are uh, there is a receptive aphasia because MCA supplies uh, later parts of the uh, temporal and parietal lobes. Uh, there may be a contralateral upper quadrantinopia uh, due to temporal lesion or left lower quadrantinopia due to parietal lesion may be there. Hemineglect occurs only if lesion affects uh, non-dominant, usually right hemisphere. MCA territory uh, is the most common location for a stroke in the cortex as the MCA is the continuation of the internal carotid artery. So traveling a Traveling of uh, clot just needs to go straight to block the middle cerebral artery as opposed to a zigzag uh, network of the anterior or posterior cerebral arteries. So how do you remember specific stroke signs according to these two main arteries? Uh, you can remember the association of the anterior cerebral artery with lower extremities and bladder by drawing this girl figure where the legs form the letter A, uh, that's for anterior. You can remember the functions of middle cerebral artery by letter M in the middle of this figure, uh, this time using the letter M as their arms. So there is also another M in uh, lip area. Uh, this should help you remember the inclusion of the uh, bunny case area. Finally, a stroke in the territory of the posterior cerebral artery is associated with defects in the visual field because it supplies occipital lobe. The most typical pattern seen is a contralateral homonymous hemipanopia with macular sparing. Uh, 
You can remember the association of the posterior cerebral artery with the visual cortex by drawing two piece like uh, sunglasses on our girl figure. Okay, uh, let's move from strokes in the cortex down to strokes in the subcortex. Strokes in the subcortex are often called as lacunar strokes with uh, lacunar means legs or empty spaces. A name that uh, makes more sense when you consider areas that lies uh, uh, areas that lies between uh, and underneath the uh, ventricles like thalamus and internal capsule with uh, third ventricle and uh, basal ganglia along with uh, lateral ventricle. Uh, lacunar strokes are the purest forms of uh, neurological deficits. It often present with pure motor deficit or pure sensory deficits. But the intact nature of uh, cortical functions, uh, there are no cortical signs present in this type of stroke. There are uh, three main forms of uh, lacunar strokes, which we'll uh, go over now. Uh, as the name implies, a pure, uh, as the name implies, a pure motor stroke uh, results in hemiparesis of the contralateral face, arm, and leg without any sensory deficits or associated cortical signs. This often results uh, from ischemic damage uh, to the posterior limb of the internal capsule which as you will recall from anatomy that it carries the corticospinal and corticobulbar tracts. A pure sensory stroke is also pretty straightforward and uh, features like numbness of the contralateral face, arm and leg without any motor deficits or associated cortical signs. As you might guess, a pure sensory stroke often results from ischemic damage to the thalamus since uh, the thalamus processes uh, all type of sensory information. Finally, because the posterior limb of the internal capsule and the thalamus are adjacent to each other, occasionally a stroke will produce ischemic damage in both of these regions at once, uh, leading to both hemiparesis and numbness of the contralateral face and extremities. If you have been following this video series so far, uh, there are um, no uh, any other mnemonics uh, that you will need here. Finally, uh, we can summarize cortical strokes from this table. You can do this yourself. Uh, if you have any questions about stroke, uh, feel free to ask or have any suggestions about videos. Uh, tell me in the comment box Thank you for watching us and if you haven't uh, subscribed it yet uh, Please uh, subscribe this channel and press the bell icon. I will see you in the next video Stay awesome